looks like. This is Reading Blue Tour, Fort Smith, Lessons 18 through 24. Now, the first thing I'd like for you to do is go out and... It's indeed my pleasure. Don't be so formal. To have <laughs> to have the chance to be alone with you. You have had so many students who look up to you and regard you as their inspiration, mentor, as they would say these days, for whom you have started on a thoughtful and also productive career within social work and social group work. And here we are at this second annual symposium in Arlington, Texas, devoted to group work. I think we are very proud that you are here with us this year, and I'll bet it makes you proud to see what is happening these days in group work. I don't know, I don't want to put words in your mouth. You have enough words of your own. <laughs> well, of course, I'm exceedingly proud of the 200 and some individuals who uh, I keep track of over the years uh, who uh, followed the pretty meticulously the one thing I asked of everybody who got their master's degree from uh, Pitt was that uh, they'd send me a copy of the papers they wrote that they liked best and of the books that they published and the announcement of their children <laughs> and that as the years re went on uh, they would bring their children to visit me so that now after uh, uh, almost 50 more than 50 years I have former students and their children and you know recently some of their grandchildren really <laughs> who uh, come to enjoy my mountain home and we always uh, uh, we, are, we have always planned the, the place that we uh, so, somebody listening might know that we is Gladys Rowland with uh, whom I shared uh, political, personal, and professional responsibilities uh, over the 70 years that we did things together. You know, the first things that uh, we ever wrote together were uh, records of tents of children in the camp we directed and so we learned our first uh, use of records because we were running a camp and then the camp belonged to the YWCA and two three books uh, two written by YWCA people and another another by uh, the uh, 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 oh, I can't think of it. The Family Service Association Publishing Company. Uh, we can correct that on the record, baby. Any because it's a well-known publishing company. It came out. It's been met, been mentioned in this conference, and the, all the records in those books were written by Gladys and me. But there's no mention of Gladys and me. So we didn't begin to get a reputation for writing for quite a while. But our first, first efforts in this direction were when we were running the Buffalo Camp uh, on the shores of Lake Erie. And you'll be interested when you come up to our house the next time. Up to our house is in Amador County, uh, northeast of Sacramento, not far from Tahoe. Uh, to find on our walls a great large picture that Gladys painted from a picture that, a Kodak picture I had of 
our camp at Lake Erie, the cliff, at which we had to guard all the time, because more than anything else, those high school uh, girls wanted to jump off the cliff into the lake, but we succeeded in never having one do it. Well, this has been a hard year for all of us who knew Gladys. I particularly, because I came from physical education and recall um, the modern dance, Jose Lamont coming at her. It wasn't that have, wonderful. And the wonderful studio and the work that we did up on, was it the 22nd floor in the Cathedral of Oh, Lyons? yes, it was. And uh, I just uh, recall her, um, I was using this year something about the place, use, and direction of activities. Her title. And that was her title. Yes. How early, and, and the wonderful contribution that she and you made together. You I can't would, separate them. I was thinking of the uh, what we are calling the Bible yesterday at our conference, uh, the Green Book. Yes. And how lucky. In 1949, that's when that came out, is it not? Oh, yes. And I was, I think it was about 1946 that some of us who were your students read different parts of the manuscript and how fresh it was at the time. I had chapter three, Method, which makes me feel so proud to have seen that in its early um, development. I think it was a unique everyone does uh, for its time and still uh, presently used amazingly. Well, it's, it was certainly the first time that anybody ever put down and had printed. Uh, not directions in terms of uh, baking a cake, but the use of the self in helping people of all different ages and so. I think a very great deal of that was uh, the first time it was ever published. One of the other things I wanted to ask you about is the publication that you wrote called Casework and Group Work. Do you remember that? <laughs> From the God Family ever... Service Association of America. That was my master's thesis. It was? From the University of Chicago. Now let's see, was it published in about 41? Am I correct? No, it was published in 38. 38. You see, when I went to Western Reserve to uh, be on the faculty that teach supervision of all things, in this day and age they wouldn't take a freshman like me to teach supervision, but that's what they did to me. And they gave me 15 students to supervise. Margaret Berry was one of them. And uh, Newsteader, no, not Newsteader, the dean of the school, uh, when he employed me, they couldn't find anybody to do this, you <laughs> see, but nevertheless, they put this stipulation down that at the end of two years, I must have my master's degree in social work. Uh, or, or, my, that was the length of my uh, assignment, and they made me an assistant professor. And so I. Uh, I uh, picked up myself and went to the University of Chicago and told Edith Abbott this. And I think you've heard me tell this story, haven't you? Edith sat up straight like this and she said, group work, <laughs> what are you gonna do with that? And so I got no <laughs> sympathy. And she rang her little bell and this secretary that I had known over the years because I'd been going to school there since I was got out of, well, long before I got my bachelor's degree. Uh, and she said, get Gertrude's record. So in the comes the secretary with these records and she went down, you know, this book like this. And then she said, you don't think we're going to give you credit for all these advanced courses you've got in sociology, do you? I said, oh, Miss Abbott, I never dreamed that you would. <laughs> I finished that course a year and a half sooner than I expected. And I got out my, my record and I had been given credit. Oh, wonderful. For everyone. Or I, I would still be at Western Reserve, maybe. 
Anyway, because as soon as I got my degree, mm -hmm. Neustetter took this job of organizing this new school. Mm -hmm. And he appointed me to be the assistant dean to do the work while he ran a camp in Canada. And that's where, when I began to get a general, generalized uh, experience in the education of social workers uh, all over the United States, because the, the uh, acting chairman of what little nucleus there was of social work at Pitt at that time uh, was, the, was Marion Hathaway, who was also the secretary of the uh, small organization of all of the schools of social work in the United States. And I fell into not only working in the school, but working with Marion, because from that moment on, we were very close, as you well know. And so that, uh, that gave me first-hand contact with the whole movement of which this conference today is a, is, is a branch of the great uh, development of, so, of social work schools. I was saying in this uh, workshop on creativity today, something that I think would interest you. In fact, the uh, group mentioned it. I was talking about the importance of a body of knowledge to be transmitted. In other words, assuming somebody has a need, needs and interest in a certain area, that would be important to expressiveness, whether it's creative or not. They need the uh, environment that uh, is congenial to that. They need the teachers and the equipment and the tools. That's the third thing. And then I said, and they need a body of knowledge that is transmissible, which for social work and for group work in particular, you had a big hand in helping make that happen. What I'm saying is, it is very interesting, not accidental, that there was a golden age for group work at Pittsburgh, and that there were theorists there and support other professors such as Marion Hathaway and Wilbur Neustadter who may not have been in the group work but who made an environment that was an exciting environment. Does that sound uh, chauvinistic as they would say today or does that make sense that in the late 40s, I would say in the early mid 40s it was Pitt and that you, had a ma you were a major uh, architect of that contribution but that that was the spot, the whole city of Pittsburgh at that time had some exciting things well, happening. Well, you see, uh, Pittsburgh uh, had, uh, the Council of Social Agencies in Pittsburgh uh, was, uh, uh, was not satisfied with the service that the agencies that they were supporting were giving. So they had employed Neustetter to do this study. And he spent two years studying the agencies in Pittsburgh mm -hmm. so that he knew them very, very well. This was one reason he felt free to go off. All the time he kept running this camp that, where his heart was. Uh, and so when, when I came, I, I fell into a situation of where the agencies were welcoming me and willing to go along with all kinds of things. We, the agencies had a part in that school that no other, yes. no other community has ever experienced. Right. And this was because of several things. One was I, I knew so little about schools, and I just thought that if agencies were going to have uh, anyway from five to six to ten students, they ought to have a part in choosing them. Well, all the other schools threw up their hands just like this when this rule of ours became. But all the time I was at, uh, at Pittsburgh, the admissions committee was different from any other school and under constant uh, criticism from the other schools because we wouldn't we wouldn't take a student that the uh, the agencies didn't want wouldn't take would, they would, they didn't choose what students they'd had mm -hmm. but their basis of choosing the students for the school was I would be willing to have this student in my school and I spent hours and hours and hours with that group because I stayed right with them. 
Was like, that an advisory group of agency? Uh, no, uh, they were the admissions committee. I see. That's why. Wonderful. I was such a uh, a uh, attacked person <laughs> in in the whole school. I was very forward. Uh, the setup. Maybe that's what helped make the field experiences so meaningful as learning experiences. Well, by the time the students got into the agencies, the executive who was on the, exa the admissions committee was so thoroughly uh, acquainted with what the school was trying to do and the quality of people that we had turned down. Mm -hmm. And you see, when I went there, uh, there were 900 and some, I've forgotten what the other, uh, other number was, uh, people who had taken some courses and I evaluated their past, their experience and their courses and then recommended to the admissions committee their admission as full-time students and a very great many of the persons who now are retired but they, they became the officials of the agencies were part of that backlog. And it was Marion's backlog. You see, Mary had been the teaching courses and- Marion Hathaway. Yes. Uh -huh. And you, we've got many, many wonderful teachers, but n none that ever surpassed Marion. And of course, every student that ever had Marion came out with this full time. Wonderful person. And then, because when it came time to fill the faculty, uh, Newsteader, I call him Noodles, you know, <laughs> uh, was up in uh, the North Woods in Canada. It was my responsibility to locate the faculty. So I picked out Ruth Garland and Ruth Smalley and Joe Lockheim and um, on the man from Minnesota who was head of, well, our first head of research. Malcolm Stinson? And, 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 and uh, Malcolm from the University of Chicago. Uh, this, this group were all people that I ran around. And was this 1940, 1939, or what? 1930, uh, let's see. Yes, it was 1938, 39. But we admitted our first students. It was 1937, 38, and we admitted our first students in 38. Mm-hmm. And some of the ones you know best were in that first group, Florence Ray, right, and and a good many of the others. You know what I often think about, and of course I was there from '44 to '46. We had group work and we had casework, and I went into my casework placement, and everybody, all the group workers, had a year of casework um, practice. Now that took a long time. I would say several decades before uh, social work education as a whole began to try to develop and did develop uh, generalist orientations where people did not have only one method. I think Pitt was very early well, you in see, that regard. You see, I had been uh, doing all kinds of social work uh, on a part-time basis and I was executive of the, of the West Side YWCA in Chicago. And I was around the University of Chicago a great deal. And all the training that I had was in casework. And so when I uh, began to work on the curriculum, and the person I ha uh, worked with most closely beside Marion was Ruth Gartland. Mm -hmm. We both agreed that, peop that both what Ruth had and what I had, we had to give to the, the students so that it was i have always been so grateful that that was part of my education yes well i think this is one of the reasons that the pitt students have excelled almost every place they've been also the people we turned down <laughs> how do you know you mean you remember the people that you turned down well some of them uh, and you, you followed know, them eh? <laughs> uh, some of them we turned down and, and uh, they went off and did things about themselves and came back. I see. But, uh, but also we didn't have, uh, I, we had very, very few student failures once the, they got into school. Because by the time they went through all this process, you know, we knew them too well to fail them. 
I remember uh, that you had records on me when I was a tap dance teacher at the Brashear Settlement doing all these, uh, I was a part-time undergraduate and Alice uh, Veeman was in a supervision class with you. You were so welcoming to me. I was 20 at the time and I was so happy. I felt so great at the beginning. <laughs> I didn't know what social work was. I mean, when I think back about um, the attractiveness, at least for me, I was one of the people that came from the leisure time, liked working with the people and camping, and I didn't know a social problem from goodness knows what, I'm sorry to say. I remember once in a group work class, you asked if group work would be different in Nazi Germany. That was a provocative question that I had never thought about, if, if group experiences would be different there. Doesn't that sound naive? Here I was. <laughs> <laughs> but I certainly uh, uh, valued, uh, my mind was uh, opened very, mm -hmm. very much through uh, what we encountered in those years. Well, when you think of what really magnificent persons uh, Ruth Garland and, and Ruth Smalley were, and their, their teaching, now many, many people think that this thing that I quote all the time, that the most important thing if you're going to help people is to love them and limit them and to help them achieve. Now, in the first place, I, the first time I used that in the Green Book, it does have a footnote of who said that first. Who did? Ruth. Gar Ruth uh, Smalley. Smalley. That's one of Ruth Smalley's smart little sayings, you know. That's, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Yes. But, uh, and oh, the things I learned from those two women that uh, and the, the support they gave me and I gave them you you see was uh, and a good deal of the uh, of the difficulty of, that later came on in Pitt was that fine as, as noodles was and I, I thoroughly enjoyed working with them in, in many ways but when it came to the finesse of helping people and working with, with the people for what they needed rather than what he needed, this he knew nothing about. And so the gap between this remarkable faculty mm -hmm. and the, the go-gettishness of, uh, of uh, W.I. Uh, well, very, very I guess people had different roles, and for for many years that I'm familiar with, it was very a uh, wonderful Camelot. Yeah, I was thinking of Ruth Smalley in a casework class that we had, the casework for group workers, and um, there was one student in my class who went out to a public assistance uh, worker and played checkers, a uh, 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 recipient went up to visit someone and we sat in the back of the room, there were about 20 of us, laughing because we knew that when you were out visiting and doing casework you weren't supposed to be playing checkers. And uh, Molly, do you remember Molly Donaldson? She was feeling... Oh yes, yes. Uh. So she was very upset that we were laughing in the back and Ruth Molly drew herself up and said, Miss Donaldson, you did what you knew how to do. <laughs> and that was her way. She was able to connect with where the learner was. I was lucky enough to work with her and when she became the dean at Penn. I, I guess she came in about 53, I think. She what? Came to the University of Pennsylvania in about 53, as I recall. She was a, a marvelous person. We were so lucky at Pitt and yes. later on at Penn. She came earlier than that, you see. Uh, uh, we all left in 50. I don't, I'm not sure that she went directly to Penn, though. Maybe she came in 51. I'm, I'm I, not I sure. I think she it was the, it was this, I'm quite sure she did. Maybe. Because I so was I a, had the benefit personally of watching and being in the uh, system yes, I where know she came did. to. She's so glad you were there, too. <laughs> I want to talk about something that you may not remember the same way I do, because you had many of these. And these, this is almost Thanksgiving now, and I'm remembering as a student, your Thanksgiving dinners that you used to have for us and how wonderful they were. 
Have you thought of that uh, recently? I'm sure my memory of those events must well, differ from yours because we were just so excited and so many people from out of town wouldn't have had a Thanksgiving. How many did you have when you would have them, you and Gladys? Oh, it, it depended on uh, on the composition of the class. Twenty at least. Uh, I yes. Guess. Or more even. Everyone was invited. I guess everyone was invited, weren't they all? Everybody that did, hadn't didn't uh, go home or have someplace else to, else to come. And uh, were you ever there when we cooked the turkey outside? Yes, yes. Because uh, uh, we just had an old gas stove. See, we had some wonderful times, both in terms of work and also, um, as you would say, socializing, knowing each other as persons. And that's one of the things you said last night. You were, t or was it this, uh, this morning, about um, getting with real persons and, and doing, I wish you would say it, I'm not even as good, do you know what I'm referring to? About the importance of uh, really connecting with another person. Well, you see, I don't belittle all the emphasis that's put on in a great many places in the literature and in the behavior of, of uh, professional social workers. Uh, professionalism at all. Uh, there are certain rules of being professional that I ha I I would uh, help I, I would insist upon, or I wouldn't let a person be a social worker if they hadn't become one already. Uh, and that's uh, uh, honesty and and uh, uh, really uh, presenting the real problem of the of the of the client and so forth. But. Uh, if a, if a person, whether they're a group worker or a case worker or a community organization or anybody, if you're going to help anybody in any kind of way according to what your ability is, and if your ability is professional, if you're going to use your profession, there's no point of trying to use your profession until you have established a person-to-person -person relationship which says for the time being with all the other things put aside you are the most important person in my life and so with the um, you, you don't I don't mean you say it I mean the show it. feeling they get you get from it yeah now let me tell you an experience I had coming from Sacramento to Dallas Fort Worth mm -hmm. on the plane uh, one of the of the um, uh, of the flight attendants, uh, waitresses. What do you call them? Stewardess. Stewardesses. There were three, and after we all got settled down and so forth, uh, this one who's very attractive, and and uh, I would say, you know, she probably is in her late twenties or early thirties, and she said. Um, she came up to me and she said that, uh, you know, uh, we're having hard times, aren't we? And I said, yes, yes, that's very true. She says, I think I'm going to be laid off. Oh, my. And she said, uh, so I'm trying to think about what I would like to do. And I've had, and she told me the courses they were had, they were good courses, good She's a graduate of college, and she's uh, there were courses that you'd take if you were going to be a social worker. And she said, uh, I've been taking courses, and I've been thinking a lot about whether I'd like to be a social worker. And she said, I just wondered if you knew anything about social work. Isn't that amazing? She and didn't uh, know... Uh, she knew me from nobody. You and look like a social worker. <laughs> uh, uh, no, I didn't Wonderful. know. Well, I looked like a person that felt like she felt. Isn't that interesting? And, you know, I said to her two or three times, you know, the other, the other uh, uh, stewardesses are going to be mad if you spend all your time with me. And she said, no, they know why I'm talking to you. Isn't that something? Uh, well, I've, you know, I was just astounded that, because I had done nothing but joke with them when I got on the plane. 
Well, but, I always thought... But that's what I mean by that. Uh-huh. Yes. You've got to be a real person. Well, I guess it's... Um, I don't know how they would call it. Uh, sometimes they speak of empathy or in openness these days or look interested in people, inviting to people. And I'm, sh I'm sure that... Uh, and some of it probably isn't label, uh, labelable. It's just no, uh, no. something happens. It's just a, a personality characteristics. And of course, uh, for now for quite some time, getting a job of any kind has been quite a problem for everybody. And the, uh, the uh, employment of social workers to do all kinds of things that are not social work has watered down the requirements. It's almost anybody that can read, write, and do arithmetic or can get a job, uh, even if they have a, a bachelor's degree, and very few uh, have to have more. In doing social work functions, is that what you're referring to, that the, uh, I suppose it's uh, the political economic they're not social work functions. And it's in all of the, the eligibility and uh, requirements that the various kinds of agencies have put on. Uh, the, and part of it is uh, all this criticism we've been having about the federal government and so forth. Part of it is, is true, but most of it is local. Uh, that, I mean, it's been permitted by local but the regulations come right, right down. So that the, by the time a person squeezes through the uh, arithmetic of getting a job, uh, they, uh, uh, th th they haven't been really uh, introduced or are given the, the jobs that are social work jobs. And the thing that to me, that this, jo this job I did when I was at the University of California for the last uh, almost 20 years, when I was training people employed by counties from Fresno to, to the Oregon border, uh, and the people were all chosen by the counties and there were local people, but always in every group there were people who cared about people and who responded to this kind of teaching, you see. Well, let's come back to our conference. Um, we've been here a day and a half, almost two days of meetings. Uh, what's your opinion about the conference so far that you've experienced? Well, of course, in, in two days' time, you don't get... I've gone to all the general sessions, and uh, your session today, I guess, was the first group sessions that we've had and uh, uh, and and that, uh, that you always have uh, unique and uh, did you make up that that introduction or did you about the zodiac yeah <laughs> yes well uh, you, I take my hat <laughs> off to you and I, I thought all the time I was sitting there wouldn't you know that was Ruth that just I went to a Chinese <laughs> restaurant and saw a place map that had all of the uh, uh, 12 months, you know, the symbols, and I uh, took it off from there, decided that will get me into four-person groups yeah, in a uh, yeah. strange way. But I, uh, coming back uh, also to the other sessions, I really enjoyed your participation, the tone you gave last night, um, the comments that you have made throughout have really, I think, been very inspiring for the new students just as I'm hoping that uh, some students sometimes will watch our conversation and get a sense of the fact that group work has had uh, many years of experience and know-how and practice uh, expertise and uh, more than sometimes uh, students might get. Uh, well, about every so often I get concerned about uh, all of us in group work being two too really honest to God human beings, competitive, competitive, and and the 
urge among the very, and we succeed in, in attracting a very intelligent, highly capable people, but for whom uh, success in whatever they're going to do seems to depend on being the originator of something brand new, <laughs> uh, of being the first in line, being the, the best of the bestest, and you know, all of those things. So this, this uh, uh, movement that we've had for uh, about the last five years of one person after coming uh, after another, developing what they call a brand new model. And I have certain great dislikes, and one of my great dislikes is the word model. Uh, because I think it's been very divisive. And all these new models, that's what I was trying to say this at this morning. Mm -hmm. All these new models, when you come down to, to, to really analyze them, and then you analyze what you do and have always done, you've always done something of the dip that would, was not drawn from the model, but because human beings have a problem and when you're helping them with, with the problem, they break down into parts, some of which is purely mechanical. And so if you, if there was time, and I never had time to do this, but you could locate most of these artificial models, if you really analyze what somebody had done to do successful helping. And then they have to announce that this is the XYZ model, you know. Uh, but my feeling uh, is, at the moment, is very optimistic. I think some of the people who were the greatest <coughs> supporters of their own design and models, and whatever you want to call them, <laughs> are coming to be more and more generic. And the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, recognition of, all, of a great variety of ways of interpreting human behavior. And do you know my story about Anna Freud uh, 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 the last time she was in, in uh, San Francisco? No, and I, if I did, I'd still want to hear it. Well, uh, it's the best. You see, the first time I ever saw Freud I was when I was in Vienna. I had been in Budapest to the world meeting of the YWCA and I'm then on the way back I've stopped back and we went to the to the clinic where Freud had his office and then we went out the, to the edge of Vienna where he had his little estate and here was a looked like a middle-aged man at that time mowing his lawn and I stood out and yelled hi are you Sigmund Freud oh no <laughs> <laughs> how wonderful and, and and we had this, just this kind of a visit, but I didn't see him professionally or all, anything. Well, years after that, Anna came to, to uh, San Francisco, and uh, my secretary, remember, you know, you never know her, Liz Hunter, uh, had, before she worked for me, had worked in Boston at the Child Guidance Clinic, and so that she had known, known Anna Freud when she'd come over there. So that uh, the uh, Anna Freud's hostess uh, invited Liz to come up and live at their house up in the, those beautiful houses in Berkeley, and uh, go uh, take Anna to the various meetings she had to go to. So then I was invited to come up one night when they were coming after they got home from the meetings. So we got in there. It was fairly late, and we uh, uh, they the. Uh, Host had a lovely fire in the fireplace, and we had chairs around. Anna sunk down in the chair in front of the fireplace, and there was a stool there, and she put her feet up like this, and she said, Ah, oh, these American psychiatrists are the queerest people I ever heard of. <laughs> to listen to them talk, you'd think Papa was God. <laughs> and Papa would feel so bad. Oh, how wonderful. 
Well, every time I get into a spot where people, you know, I get blamed for being just pure Freudian, and which I'm not at all. I have great ad admiration for me. But, but there isn't a silly thing as a pure Freudian, because what people think Freudian thought, they can't find in the book any place he said it. Right. And That's a fascinating story. I think so. I, okay. Well, Gertrude, I'm not going to embarrass you, but uh, I was surprised to hear that you are 85. I hope you don't mind telling your age. Oh, no, I tell it all over. Uh, I was born in 1895, and, and uh, I, I didn't realize that being 85 was really uh, as old as it is, except that most of these people we've been talking about are gone. Yes, yes. And I, uh, there, there, there are very few of, of those of us who, in, you know, used to talk about uh, being group workers, uh, and long before we had the, the, uh, uh, the uh, study of group work or any of those organizations, you see, and they're all gone. So that makes me realize that 85 isn't so young. Well, and of course I've only been si uh, sick this year, so I haven't had much experience not being able to walk well. Well, I think you've seen a lot. I know you've seen a lot. About two minutes. Thank you. And I was thinking last night, when people talked about history, it was so fortunate for us that you could get up and you'd say, no, this is how it really was. So uh, you, you contributed before you were old, uh, six, uh, 85. You contributed, um, and now you're contributing to us by being here and um, imparting your ideas still, which are, to me, well, as vital as ever. You see, I've had lots of experiences of, of being in, in, um, at conferences and things where there were great differences of opinion, and my opinion was different and so forth. But I don't think I ever ran into a situation like that situation last night in which that paper was just full of things that just n just couldn't have happened. Well, we were lucky you set us straight. I uh, think we have to stop. I uh, hate to stop our conversation. I've enjoyed it. I don't know how. Oh, you're you feel. always a joy to talk to, Ruth. <laughs> ever, Thank you. Ever since I met you long before you came to school. <laughs> Thank you, Gertrude.